So I'm going to go, go through two things, really. Um, I'm going to be talking about a particular process that I've applied many times in the past when designing an application graph data model. So the assumption here is that you've chosen Neo4j to back your application. Neo4j offers up some certain graph primitives. Emil talked about those in the keynote, things like nodes, relationships, properties, and labels. But as a, an application developer, uh, you're going to apply those primitives to design your own application graph data model, something that represents your domain and allows you to answer the kind of questions that you want to ask of your domain. So we're going to go through a kind of step-by-step -step process that you can apply here, and a process that you can apply in an incremental and iterative fashion as you're beginning to develop and evolve your application. Um, that's going to take up the bulk of the, of the session, but then I'll just review at the end those building blocks, those four fundamental building blocks, and how typically we apply them when developing our own application data model. So I'll start by the modeling process, or start with the modeling process itself. And the first point I want to make here is that we're developing a model. We're not trying to develop uh, a transparent window onto reality. You know, you're always motivated by something. You've got a set of requirements. You're setting out to develop an application. Therefore, you're setting out to satisfy a set of end user or applica application goals. And so what we want to do is to develop a model that helps us address those particular goals. So it's not so much about faithfully reproducing the way we think reality really works or looks. It's about creating a model that helps us address a particular set of problems. And this is actually what we, we saw you know, at the very foundation of graph theory with the, the seven bridges of Konigsberg problem. You know, Euler effectively took uh, a real world problem but applied a number of abstractions until he ended up with a model that helped him satisfy or answer a particular set of questions. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here as well. So the, the key recommendation that we always make when, when we're developing our own model is design this model for queryability. Okay. So really this means design according to your use cases. Allow the use cases to drive out your model um, and allow the questions that you want to ask of your domain, the questions that are inherent in each of those use cases, drive out the kind of model that make it very easy to ask and answer those questions. So assuming that you have some set of requirements, and they can be in any form really, I, this, this doesn't pre presuppose any particular way of expressing requirements. It may be that you start with agile user, user stories, or it may be you have a more formalized set of, of functional requirements. But starting with those requirements, which effectively express a set of end user or application goals, what we're going to do is to work through this little step-by-step -step process and apply it over and over again, requirement by requirement. So we're going to take a, a kind of natural language representation of a requirement. You just use a story or some written piece of text, and we're going to turn it on its head. We're going to, to look at that requirement and drill down and try and unpack the questions that we would have to ask of our domain in order to be able to satisfy that requirement. So that's step one. We're then going to take those questions and we're going to pick them apart a bit. For each question, we're going to try and identify the entities, the things in our domain that we're really interested in, the things in our domain that are core to our understanding of this particular problem. And we're also going to try and identify the ways in which those entities are connected or related to one another. And we'll just do that by parsing the questions. That's step two. Step three, we're really going to formalize those expressions of, or our understanding of those entities and those relationships. We're going to turn our natural language representations into cipher path expressions. Okay? And we'll see that uh, as part of this worked example. And those cipher path expressions effectively become the basis for our application graph data model. Okay. If we can stamp out multiple instances of these path expressions, if we can create nodes and relationships according to those path expressions, we will have the basis of a model and we will have a data set that is fit for addressing the kind of questions that we want to ask of our domain. And then in step four, we can return to the questions and we can translate those questions into cipher queries that we can actually execute against our model or execute against our data set. And what we'll find here is that the majority of the queries that we want to execute 
contain cipher path expressions that look very similar to the path expressions that we used to build the model in the first place. So we see that the queries and the model itself, they're effectively two sides of the same coin. Okay. So we'll do that for one particular requirement, and then effectively you can rinse and repeat. And over time, you will drive out more, part, more elements within your model, you will evolve your model, you'll perhaps end up restructuring parts of it. But this is, this is the core of the process, the little step-by-step -step process that we've applied over and over again. So I've got a little example. Okay. Let's assume that I want to build a knowledge management application. Something that allows me to capture details about people and the companies that they work for and their professional skills. And the reason I want to do this is because I want to be able to create a kind of professional social network. Perhaps I work within a very large organization, large distributed organization. And I want to find people within that organization who share some of my skills. Perhaps because we want to set up a discussion group or I want to identify people who can help me solve a particular problem that I'm faced with. You know, I've got a particular gnarly Java problem. Who else within the organization could help me solve this problem? Or perhaps I want to staff a new project and I want to discover people within the organization who can help staff bring particular skills to that project. Okay. So these kind of knowledge management applications that allow us to connect people and the companies that they work for and the skills that they possess. And for my particular app, I want it actually to be a cross-organizational uh, application. I want to capture details of people, not only the people who work for my company, but who work elsewhere, or people that I've worked with who work elsewhere. And my assumption is, you know, this is the way in which I've worked in the past, that we have a series of requirements expressed as agile user stories. That's just the way that I've worked in the past. It's prioritized backlog of requirements, and we're just going to pick those requirements off, highest priority first, and begin to design and develop the solution um, and, and work our way through that backlog of requirements in that fashion. So here's one of those requirements. This is a an old-fashioned agile user story uses the kind of as a, I want, so that uh, template. As an employee, I want to know who in the company that I work for has similar skills to me so that we can exchange knowledge or so that I can identify people who can help me solve a problem. Okay. So this is a description of uh, an end-user goal, something that I want to achieve. Okay. And I want to be able to build a part of the application or build a particular feature that helps satisfy this goal. So this Agile user story describes what it is that we're trying to achieve. Okay? So now I have an understanding of, of the goal or the problem at hand. What I'm going to do is to take that description of the story and just turn it on its head. I'm just going to rephrase it in the form of one or more questions, in this case just one question, which if I can answer that question, effectively I can address this end user goal. So the story describes what it is that we're trying to achieve. The questions that we would ask of our domain effectively tell us how we would go about addressing that goal or satisfying that goal. So here's the question. Which people who work for the same company as me have similar skills to me? If I can ask and answer that question, then effectively I can solve this particular end user goal. I can effectively create a solution to this particular requirement. So we've taken the story and identified one or more questions that would help us address that end user goal. So given that question, we then start to parse it. We then start to look for the entities in our domain that are of interest to us. You know, the things that seem to be core to our domain with which we deal. So here we have two, perhaps three entities and typically we're looking at nouns, common nouns, things like that within that sentence. So we have people and companies and skills. Okay? And in the singular, we have a person, we have a company, we have a skill. Now I've put a question mark against skill here because given this one story, I'm not supremely confident that this is an entity. Perhaps a skill is just an attribute of a person. You know, Ian has one or more skills. <coughs> Perhaps they're attributes of Ian. You know, Ian's skilled in Neo4j, in C Sharp, in Java, and so on. Is skill just an attribute, or is it uh, an entity, a thing in and of itself within my domain? Um, 
I mean, knowing, you know, I'm going to skip forward or, or fast forward and anticipating this little fictional domain, um, I'm going to say that actually I'm confident that this is an entity, this is a core entity in my domain. I am particularly interested in skills. So it's not that these are just simple attributes of people. They're things that I'm very, very particularly interested in. Perhaps because in the future, knowing that there are other requirements here, um, I can anticipate that I want to create a taxonomy of skills. I want to be able to relate skills amongst themselves. And that there's, in fact, something very interesting about the way in which people are related to their skills. People have different degrees of proficiency. Some people are beginners. Some are experts. Okay. So all of those things, you know, expanding the context here and anticipating a few other requirements, give me a degree of confidence now that skill is not just a simple attribute in the same way that eye colour or age is a simple attribute. I feel more confident that skill is a, a distinct entity within my domain. So we passed the question and identified three different entities. And we're not dealing with anything about graph databases at this point. We're just parsing some questions and identifying entities. And now, the ways in which those entities are related. So again, going back to the question, we can see that a person works for a company and a person has a skill. Okay. All right. Well, you can see where I'm headed with this. The, the verbs here, works for and has, are candidate relationship names in a graph model. And the entities are candidate labels. So we've got some common nouns, person and company and skill. We're probably going to have nodes within our data set that represent people and companies and skills. So person, company and skill are candidate label names and the verbs here are candidate relationships. So at this point, we begin to formalize the model. Um, we've just got some very simple natural language expressions of the stuff that we're interested in. But now we can turn these things into cipher path expressions. We can say, well, probably in our, in our model or in our data set, we're going to have nodes labeled person that are connected by way of outgoing works for relationships to nodes labeled company. And similarly, those nodes labeled person will be connected by way of an outgoing has skill relationship to nodes labeled skill. Now I've actually kind of cheated a little here because up here we had a person has a skill and down in the cipher path expression I've used the relationship name has skill. And I've done that for a very particular reason. Has in and of itself is a very, very general term. You know, I can have a skill, I can have a job, I can have a family, I can have a fear of clowns and balloons. And if we use the relationship name has throughout my data set, then queries that are looking to traverse has relationships will actually discover enormous swathes of graph, whereas in fact we actually wanted to target just a much smaller portion of the, the data set. So coming up with good relationship names is key to developing a good model. And occasionally where you come across a very, very generic term such as has, it's worthwhile specialising it some way. Good question. Uh, when you, uh, when you're matching your, your data set, uh, if you are looking for skills, you would match it against as a known for skill. Then yeah, so, that problem. so the question here is that I can avoid that problem by even if I even if I used has throughout the data set. Um, I can still ensure that I find the right pieces of data by matching against a skill label at the end of those relationships. And that's, that's certainly something that I could do. The thing is that I will still end up having to traverse lots of has relationships only to discover that at the end of it, there is a node that doesn't have that label. So I want as quickly as possible to gray out huge swathes of graph based on relationship name. Okay. So it's, it's a bit clumsy and I think you probably think of Better terms here, you know, a person is skilled in, or something like that, would probably read better. But um, I, I've chosen this, this relationship name, has skill. But yeah, I, certainly um, there are ways in which, or applications where it's not possible to discriminate on relationship name, and you have to discriminate based on the label at the end of that relationship. Okay. So I've got two cipher path expressions, um, separated by a comma here, 
I can actually do a little bit of refactoring now. I can actually consolidate these two path expressions into a single path expression. So I can say, look, a person works for a particular company and a person has a particular skill, has a skill, has skill, skill. Right? So I've taken the two simple path expressions and just turned them into one larger path expression, which you know, from the keynote this morning, we know is just uh, an ASCII art representation of a drawing. Yeah. The easiest way to communicate uh, details about your domain, the easiest way to, to describe a graph is to draw it. So we've got a node labeled person, an outgoing works for relationship, and an outgoing has skill relationship. And this cipher path expression is simply uh, the ASCII art representation of that path. Okay. So at this point, we've got a path expression that captures all of the information that's important to us for this particular end user requirement. If we can build an application that can effectively stamp out multiple instances of this, this path over and over again, you know, can build up a data set where we see instances of this path occurring over and over again, then effectively we'll have a data model and a data set that helps address this particular requirement. So if we look at this little sample model here, we can see that that path occurs over and over again. Ian works for Acme. Ian has the skill Java. There's one instance of the path. Ian works for Acme. Ian has the skill C Sharp. Lucy works for Acme, has the skill Java, and on and on. Many, many instances of that path, even in this simple data model. What I'm not going to, to talk about in this particular session is the way in which we build the application that creates that data and creates that data in a way that ensures that there's only one node representing Acme in our data set, only one node representing Java and so on. Um, there are, I, I think some of this may come up in other sessions, perhaps the Cypher session, talking about creating unique nodes and so on. The key point here is that we've got a, a kind of prototypical path, which is the basis of our data model, and we can see that in a, a kind of example data set, we can see multiple instances of that path. So now that we've got our little uh, example data model, we can go back to the question that we want to ask of our domain and see how we could express that as a cipher query, as something that we could pose to our data. So here's the question again. Which people who work for the same company as me have similar skills to me? And in order to be able to answer this question, effectively what we're going to have to do within our data set is to discover multiple instances of the, this little diamond-shaped pattern. We can assume that somewhere in that data set there is a node labelled person that represents me, whoever the current logged on user is. And that person will work for a particular company and that person will have a particular skill. Now, maybe I have several different skills, but we're, we're trying to, to narrow the focus here at this point in time. So I work for a particular company, I have a particular skill. I'm looking for people, for other people, so nodes labelled person, and we'll call them colleagues, who work for the very same company, connected to the very same company node, and connected to the very same skill node. That's somebody who has at least one skill in common with me. Now, if somebody has two or three skills in common with me, we'll want to match this diamond-shaped pattern two or three times on their behalf. You know, me, a person, we both work for the same company, but it's that bottom leg which will vary with each match. And we'll see some examples of that in a moment. So I've tried to find the, the smallest possible pattern that would help answer that question. And I can now translate that pattern into uh, a cipher query. Okay, so here's the cipher query that represents that question. And I'll walk through it bit by bit. The match clause here is the part of the query where we describe to the database what kind of graph pattern, what kind of graph structure am I looking for inside this existing data set. Okay. And these two lines, these two cipher path expressions here are the cipher representation of that diamond-shaped pattern. There's a node labelled person, which we're going to assign to an identifier me. I work for a particular company. I have a particular skill. We're looking for other people, and we'll call them colleagues, who work for the very same company and work for the very same skill, or, or, or have the very same skill. So these things here are identifiers, me, company, colleague, 
and skill are all identifiers. You can think of them as variables that exist purely for the duration of the query so that we can refer elsewhere in the query to bits of the, the, the data that we've actually matched in the underlying data set. Okay. And the fact that we've got company occurring twice and skill occurring twice mean that we're referring to the very same node. The very same pinching it at the top here, the very same company node, pinching it at the bottom here, the very same skill node. The where clause here is effectively saying I want to anchor this pattern on a particular node in the data set. I want to find the node that represents me. So I want to find the node labelled person whose name property value is whatever it is that I've supplied to the query. This is a parameterized query. So I would likely pass in the value E in here and we would end up anchoring this pattern on the node in the data set that represents E in. And then effectively what we want to do is to just flex it around that anchor point seeing how, how often we can match it. And then the return clause is just generating a, a result set on behalf of the client. And what I want to do is to create a kind of tabular result set. I want a number of columns. I want a column uh, called name, and I want to list the names of all the people that I found. I want a column called score, that effectively scores that person with regard to the number of skills they have in common with me. And then I want a third column called skills, and I want a comma-separated list of all the skills that this person actually has in common with me. So we're taking all of the colleague nodes, taking their name property and aliasing it as name. We're then counting up all the skills. So remember, if somebody has two or three skills in common with me, we're going to match this diamond-shaped pattern two or three times on their behalf. And the count function here effectively aggregates those matches on behalf of this particular colleague. Um, and we can count the number of skills that we've matched and return that as their score. And then because it's useful not only to know how many things somebody has in common with me, but it's useful to know which things they have in common with me, um, we're using the collect function to create a comma-separated list of all those skills. And then we're ordering the results by score, high score first. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a particular reason why you uh, use the where clause instead of just doing the any, any uh, uh, no, there isn't. So the question is, is there any reason why I have anchored this pattern using the where clause, whereas in fact, um, in today's cipher, I could in fact have used a little bit of JSON syntax there to do person, name, colon, Ian. Um, no, they're, they're both equivalent. Um, this is a slightly more old-fashioned. Um, old-fashioned. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So one question here and then... Yeah. That's a very good question. And yes, I should really use more labels. So I've, I've omitted lots and lots of labels that I could use here, um, purely for convenience, purely to, to make it very easy to put all of this up on the, uh, on the screen. But ideally, let's go back a little, um, I could pr uh, use colon company here and colon skill there. And I'm actually supplying more information, uh, and similarly colon person here, I'd be supplying more information to the Cypher query engine, which would help it uh, further narrow the query or take advantage of some underlying statistics in the database uh, in order to optimize the query plan. So the advice actually would be supply as many labels um, as you can in order to tell Cypher as much as you know about the domain. So I've, yeah, I've omitted some here, but it's a very, very good point. So you have one question. So I, I think you might have partially answered my question just there, or perhaps smallly, but specified that me, so I'm a person. Yeah. Yes, it's a very similar point. I could have specified that colleague also was a person. You know, supplying as much information as necessary. Is there one? Uh, you asked this gentleman just a few seconds ago. Yeah. Uh, leading back to my first question, mm. uh, uh, you just said providing labels gives the, the engine extra information. Yeah. No, because it's always useful to supply more labels because that will help guarantee uh, the quality of the data that's coming back. By supplying more labels, we actually allow the, uh, the Cypher engine to take advantage of some statistics that it's gathered about the number of 
nodes associated with each label and the, number, the average number of relationships attached to each of those nodes so that Cypher can make intelligent decisions as to where to start the query from this end or from that end. Do you want to start from a, a low number of relationships or a high number of relationships? But still, by specializing your relationship names, you are guaranteeing to exclude large portions of the graph very, very quickly. So it's kind of belt and braces approach. All right. So let's, let's just see how that actually works out in practice. So there's my little toy data set. And we will want to try and match that diamond shape pattern as many times as possible. Here's the first match. It's anchored on the node representing Ian. I work for Acme, as does Lucy. Ian has the skill of Java, as does Lucy. There's our first match. Here's our second match. Again, Ian and Lucy, who both work for Acme, but this time around, we, sh we share the skill neo for j And the third match, Ian works for Acme, Bill works for Acme, Ian and Bill both have the skill neo for j in common. So if we execute that query, we'll end up with that result. You can see the columns there, name, score, and a comma-separated list of the skills that these pe people have in common with me. So that's our one requirement that we've dealt with. And ideally, we would iterate, we'd pick the next requirement off the backlog and begin to, to continue to work on the model. And it may be that uh, we, we identify new kinds of relationship, new kinds of properties to attach to existing nodes or relationships. It may be that we discover that in order to address both requirements, something that we've modeled the first time round as a simple property is best pulled out as a node but gradually we will evolve the model so that it's as simple as possible, but no simpler, um, but no more complex uh, than is absolutely necessary in order to, to deal with all our application requirements. So we took a simple uh, requirement, simple representation of requirement, uh, identified the questions that we would have to ask of our domain in order to satisfy that requirement, uh, identified the entities and the ways in which those entities were related, and formalize that as cipher path expressions. That become, became the basis of our underlying data model. And then we went back to the question and identified the pattern that we would have to find in order to answer that question and express that as a cipher query. And it's no surprise that the path expressions in the query look very, very similar to the path expressions that we used when we were first creating the underlying data model. So just a couple of minutes left, I'll very, very quickly review um, the way in which we've applied those fundamental building blocks. Uh, typically, we use nodes to represent entities, the things in our domain that we're interested in, anything that has identity. And we use properties to represent the attributes of those nodes, age, eye color, first name, last name, that kind of stuff. Um, plus occasionally some metadata, perhaps a version number or a timestamp. But the core use of properties with regard to nodes is typically to represent entity attributes. We then structure the domain by introducing relationships, named and directed relationships. The relationships help connect the entities, they help structure the overall domain, they help lend semantic context to each of those individual nodes. Um, and typically, whereas we use properties on nodes to represent entity attributes, um, we can also attach properties to relationships but here we'll use the properties to represent uh, something about the relationship, its strength, or its weight, or its quality. Or again, we may, may want to attach some metadata, a version number, or a timestamp. Um, iterating over my model, I decided I want to represent a person's proficiency with regard to a skill. So I attached an, a, a property to relationships, a numeric property, level, indicating something about the strength or the quality of that relationship. And then finally, we're using labels. We can attach labels to each of our nodes. And typically, we use labels to represent the roles that a node plays within our data set. This node represents a person. This node uh, represents a skill. Labels allow us to group nodes together to ask the database, find me all the nodes representing a person, um, and also allow us to associate things like indexes and constraints. Okay. Um, that's pretty much it. We've actually touched on all of those, the, 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 those other slides in terms of nouns and, and verbs and stuff like that. <laughs>
There's more detail in the book here. There's a good chapter about actually modeling your domain. Um, if you register at graphdatabases.com, even if you don't get a print copy today, you can get a PDF in the future. So thank you very much for coming along. Hope that was useful.